Hey everyone, we'd love to hear how God is using this ministry in your life. So please send us your story at amen at fusionchurch.cc. If you would like more information about what's going on at Fusion Church or to give to this ministry online, you can visit us at fusionchurch.cc. Thanks for watching and enjoy the message. Appreciate everybody that's watching together in our services. Come on church, let's put our hands together. Let's appreciate you. We love you guys. So many people watching online, and we are ready for what God is up to. Man, he moved in a powerful way in worship. And uh, this week, I had an encounter with Jesus, and the message series that we're in is Encounters. So who knows, it's a good thing when you're having an encounter with Jesus coming face to face. And so I just took a portion of really a day and a half to fast, to put aside food, to dig into the presence of God. And as I was worshiping in scripture, I came up uh, with John chapter 4. And so if you've got your notes with you, I'd love to dig in to John chapter 4. And the title for today's message is this, don't let your label stop you from having an encounter. Let's read that together. Don't let your label stop you from having an encounter with Jesus. I think too many of us do not have encounters with Jesus Christ because of the labels that we're wearing, the labels that have somehow defined us, the labels that have somehow been placed on us by people, labels of our family, labels of where we grew up in, labels of our failures, label of, and I wrote this down, not good enough, not good enough, a, a label of guilt, a label of not making enough, a label of not being a good enough Christ follower, a label of, and the list goes on and on. And, and I think even rolling up to Father's Day weekend that is coming up next weekend, and it's going to, I mean, I believe three or four weeks ago, God laid that message on my heart. You're made for this, and not just for men, not just for dads, but I think all of us are destined for this grand design, and I can't wait to share with what God is saying, and not just this one-year anniversary birthday party for our Saturday night service, but so much more than what God is doing in the future here at Fusion Church. And so don't let your label stop your encounter. D don't let it stop you tonight from going to the next level. And so we start in John chapter 4, and if you've got your Bible or your app with you, go ahead and open to that scripture and a little bit of background right before this. If you remember, uh, Jesus is really kind of healing people left and right. I mean, it's just some supernatural stuff happening. And so he had been uh, kind of in the same area as John the Baptist at that time. They were both baptizing people. Jesus wasn't baptizing. His disciples did the baptizing. John the Baptist, if you remember, uh, was baptizing. And there was a little bit of a conflict going on. And I love what Jesus says. Jesus says, listen, John, I I'm going to go. I'm, you do your thing, and I'm going to go. And so he makes this journey, and this journey was about three days of walking. You had to go through Samaria, and if you remember uh, from recent weeks, many of the encounters that people are having with Jesus are Samaritans. A Samaritan was less than a dog to a Jewish individual. And we've come to this conclusion through the uh, Samaritan that was a leper. We've come to the conclusion... Even last week as we looked at the Word of God, as we've come to this conclusion, Jesus doesn't let anyone's label stop them from having an encounter. And this next portion of Scripture is probably for me one of the greatest encounters that someone has with Jesus Christ. And so as Jesus was journeying, we start in verse 6. He, he's tired and he's thirsty. And in verse 6, it says he comes to Jacob's well, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. And then what is the next portion of the scripture says? It was about noon. Let's read it together, all services. It was about noon. One more time. It was about noon. And, and so noontime was there. Jesus was tired and dirty. He wasn't, you know, in an Uber somewhere. He wasn't in a cab somewhere. He wasn't driving in his car. No, he was dusty and thirsty because he was on this three-day journey. And he comes to Jacob's well and in verse 7, it says, When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Verse 8 says, His disciples had gone into town to buy food. Those disciples, man, they were always hungry 
Or, I mean, they didn't care. Come on, let's be honest. They didn't care about healing people. They were just caring about, like, can I feed my stomach? I mean, they were good church folk, you know? Good church folk, all they care about is, when are you going to give me some feed? I mean, let's be honest. Most of you are like, Pastor, you better preach quick because I want that Klondike bar afterwards. And I checked them. They're all rock hard, just like a Klondike bar needs to be. Rock hard right there. But you're like, Pastor, hurry up with this preaching because I want that Klondike bar. What will you do for a Klondike bar? I will have that pastor preach real quick so that I can get myself a Klondike bar. So anyway, those good old disciples were looking for food again. They leave Jesus by themselves. I mean, would you ever leave Jesus by yourself? I'm like, he would be a game changer. And when you leave him, that's when he gets himself in trouble. So it says in this next portion of scripture in verse 9, it says the Samaritan woman, everyone say Samaritan woman, Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said, draw this. So then in verse 9, we see, you are a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Verse 10, Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you, what are those words? Living water. If you asked of him, he would have given you living water. The question that I want to ask you today is why are you letting your label stop you from having an encounter? Why are you allowing the living water not to give you the encounter that you need? The next portion of the scripture goes on to say in verse 11, she says, Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw and the well is deep. You have nothing to draw, and the well is deep. Man, I was having an encounter when I was reading this this week. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? Remember, she was at Jacob's well. Okay, so both Samaritan and Jew associated Jacob as the father who gave us the well and drank from it himself, and also as his sons and livestock. Jesus answered in verse 13, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water that I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Verse 15, the scripture says, The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that it will not be thirsty and have to keep coming to draw this water. And this is where the encounter happens. And he says to her, he says, Go, call your husband and come back. Go and call your husband and come back. Go and call your husband and come back. When Jesus said that, she must have thought, I'm in trouble now. I am in trouble because she knew why she was at the well at noontime. She replies to him in verse 17. She says, I have no husband, she replied. Jesus says to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you have had five husbands, and the man that you have now is not even your husband. What you have said is quite true. What you have said is quite true. In fact, he then tells her, he says, go and be released. Go and and be set free. Go and have this encounter. And what we, we don't have time to kind of dig into this, but I would love for you to spend time even this week alongside of your soap reading this is to be able to go and see when this woman that has been defined by her past has an encounter with Jesus, she goes back to her town and the scripture begins to say that literally that town is set on fire. Revival begins because this woman with a label had an encounter with Jesus Christ. The question that I've got to ask you today is don't let your label stop you from having an encounter. What is that label that is stopping you from having an encounter? Is it failure of the past? Is it multiple relationships? Is it a health situation? Is it a business failure? Is it something that happened when you were growing up? Or was it something with your parents? Was it the label that you were given? You grew up on the wrong side of the tracks. You you weren't educated. I mean, this week I was meeting with someone in my office and we were kind of talking back and forth about some things. And this individual was telling me uh, the the thought process they had. and, And I said, well, I said, have you ever thought what I feel like? 
I mean, I, I grew up in a town so poor in South Africa, and I know you guys will mock me about this, but literally grew up at points in my life with homemade clothes. My dad was a sex addict. My, my mom still struggles with the challenges that she has in my life. My sister has had cancer three times and continues to be healed by God. So that's a supernatural miracle. I've gone through three civil wars. I, I'm an uneducated white South African. I mean, that's like the worst thing to ever have. I mean, at least, you know, some people have literally told me, at least be a, a, a real African. And I, I'm like, well, what's a real African? I mean, you, know, you, you following me? Like, well, what's a real, you know, well, and then, then, then they don't want to tell me what a real African looks like. I say, well, so they have to have darker skin color? And they're like, and then them, in their mind, they're like, I'm going to get themselves in trouble at that point, you know? So, so and, and growing up, and, and then coming to the United States, I, if I'm very honest and transparent, there is always these labels that follow me. There is always these labels that, that you're not good enough. You will never be this. You will never be that. And maybe you and I can identify today that there are some labels that are hindering us from having an encounter with Jesus Christ. You, you didn't grow up and you didn't go to the right high school and you didn't get on the right sports team or you've got a divorce in your past or you, you've got this in your past and you've got that. And, and every time you want to have an encounter with Jesus Christ, it's literally the enemy of your souls. It's the John 10 verse 10 that begins to come up because it says in that scripture that the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus has come to give you life and life abundantly. But the enemy will lie to you and say, you're not good enough. The enemy will lie to you and say, that's too big of a vision. The enemy will lie to you and say, but don't you understand you've had five husbands, and now you still have one at home, and you're coming to the well at the noonday because you're too afraid to come in the morning when the other ladies are coming, or you're too afraid to come in the evening when the other people are coming, so you've got to come in the hardest point of your life, and that's number one if we want to dig into the points today. Number one is this. When life is at its hottest, you're ready for an encounter. Let that sink in. In life, when it is the hardest, I'm here to tell you today that you are preparing, you are ready, you are getting yourself ready for an encounter because I bet you that that Samaritan woman was never ready to encounter the Messiah, Jesus Christ, when she got to the well. I mean, you know, she was like, are there any other ladies out there? Are there any TV cameras? No one's checking in on Facebook at Jacob's well today, so I can get there. You know, does that make sense? You know, and she, she gets to the well, and then here is this Jewish rabbi that is sitting by himself. Like, time out. Like, Jesus is sitting by himself. Come on, press in a little bit. Like, where else in Scripture is Jesus by himself? Like, the Garden of Gethsemane when his disciples are sleeping. But everything else is like hundreds of people that are following him. And then this divine moment in the hottest part of the day that Jesus... Jesus arrives. I mean, her life is a little bit of hell right now. And she gets there and she says, I just need a little bit of water. And in that moment, the Messiah, Jesus himself, the son of God, is just chilling at Jacob's well, hanging out, scrolling his Instagram feed on his iPhone or Android, whatever you prefer to believe in. Pastor Tom, Android, help us Jesus. No confessions there. When life is at its hottest, where are you right now? What are those labels that are defining you? What are those circumstances that you just think you can't get rid of? And I'm here today to tell you that your encounter is around the corner. Just don't stop. Tell your neighbor, neighbor, just don't stop. Come on, tell them, neighbor, just don't stop. Come on, tell them, other neighbor, neighbor, don't stop, don't stop. Come on, don't stop. Why? Because there is an encounter that's about to happen. But I think so many of us just say, well, I'm not going to go to the well today. I'm not going to go to church today. I'm not going to get a drink today. I'm not going to soak today. I'm not going to dig into my word today. I'm not going to go to connect group today. I'm not going to sign up for a dream team today. I'm not going to tithe today because I don't think it's working. I'm not going to ask the church for help. Watch last week's message if you missed it. But in the hottest time of your life, do not give up because your encounter is about to happen. 
And in those moments, we can encounter Jesus Christ if we do not give up, if we do not unpack, if we do not believe the literal lies of the enemy that he is trying to get inside of us because he wants to stop us from getting to the well in the hardest times of our life. In fact, in that scripture in John chapter 4 verse 6, it says, Jacob's well was there and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. And when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? A Samaritan woman. I was doing some studying and I was just reading about Samaritans. And in the studying, they, they said that, a, that there was a Samaritan man. So he was considered by the Jew less than a dog. But a Samaritan woman was not even fit enough to be less than a dog. In fact, in, in Jewish culture, and like, I'm just so ashamed of this stuff sometimes, that the church can treat the people far from Jesus so bad. Because I think we do the same thing. Like if you don't worship like us, or you don't look like us, or you don't know your Bible, or you don't you know, wear the t-shirt, or those things, like... Like, we act just like these Jewish people in biblical times. And, and so this, the, this writer was saying that, that a Samaritan woman was so unclean, it was like she was having a menstrual period all the time. Because in Jewish culture, you couldn't even go close to the temple if you were on your menstrual period. And, and, and the writer was saying that the Jews, the church folk, considered the Samaritan, the unchurched, so dirty, the woman, so dirty, that she was unclean all the time. So when this woman met Jesus, please understand, it, it was so defiling in that moment. And you know what Jesus says? I'm thirsty. I'm thirsty. Like, I, I don't care about your label. I don't care what you've gone through. I don't care what you're thinking right now. Because you know what she was thinking? She was thinking the very pail that I'm holding, the very bucket that I'm holding, the very rope that I'm holding is so defiled that this Jewish rabbi can't even touch it. And I think the church needs to get this attitude because in that moment, you know what Jesus says? I'm thirsty. Give me a drink. Give me a drink. Now, I thought it's so similar to what we talked about a few months ago in Daniel chapter 3, verse 18 and 19. It's not in your notes, but here's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that are in the fire because King Neb is so infuriated, he heats the fire to seven times. Remember what seven was? God's number of creation. That in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the noonday sun, God is, ready to do, God is getting ready to do a supernatural miracle. See, I, I, I thought about this when I was studying the scripture. Is that this Samaritan woman? Come on, God. She didn't realize what Jesus touches, he sanctifies. So some of us are sitting here right now, and you're going, no, but you don't understand my label. You don't understand the label of lust. You don't understand the label of pornography. You don't understand the affair. You don't understand the bad deals that I've done. You don't understand the money that I've taken. You don't understand the depression and the, the medication that I take for it. You don't understand this. You don't understand that I've tried to commit suicide and I didn't kill myself and now I'm really upset about it. You don't understand the multiple relationships. You don't understand the sexual abuse that I've gone through. You don't understand what someone's done and I am not worthy of a touch of Jesus. And you know what Jesus says? Give me a drink of water. Because in the midst of you giving me a drink of water, that which I touch is sanctified. That which I touch is sanctified. 
Come on. When I look at Scripture, Jesus touches a leper and he is sanctified. Jesus touches a Samaritan woman and she is sanctified. Jesus touches people and they are changed. I mean, there is a young man that they dig open the roof to let him down and Jesus says, be healed. That which you touch, Jesus sanctifies it. And yet so many of us are believing the lie of the enemy that our label hinders us from having an experience with Jesus Christ. I'm not educated enough. I'm not from the right side of town. You don't understand what I've gone through or I'm too educated or I'm this. And Jesus says that which I touch is what I sanctify. In that moment, This woman has such a supernatural encounter with Jesus. Then she says this. This blows my mind. Because point two is this. Encounters lead us to deep wells. Encounters lead us to deep wells. Verse 11. Let's read it together. So the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. The well is deep. The one, come on, let's do it together. The well is deep. Where can you get this living water? The well is deep, sir. My label is too messed up for you. You don't understand what I've gone through. You don't understand my past. But tell me, tell me where I can get this living water. And so I wrote myself a note because this was ministering to me this week. And I said, Brandon, what is a deep well for you? Ask yourself the question. What is a deep well for you? What is a deep encounter for you? What is going further than that label that you've hindered from coming closer to Jesus? Now, thought about it. Deeper than where I am now. What's deep? Because I think, oh, uh, you, you know, here's the thing in church. It's like, pastor. The church is not deep enough. Have you ever heard that? The, the messages are not deep enough. No one heard that. Correct. We've all heard that, you know? And, and you know what the response is? Deep is where you're at. But if you want to go deeper, dig a deeper well. Go for a deeper experience with Jesus Christ. Go there yourself. This woman in the midst of the heat of the noonday sun said, I'm going to go find myself some water. And she had an encounter with Jesus Christ. And I think many times when we're looking to have an encounter, please understand me. Some of us are looking to go with some other people. Some of us are saying, hey, will you come with an encounter with me? Will you journey with me? Will you do this with me? And there are some times that you have to dig the well by yourself. You have to go deep by yourself. In fact, I love what the prophet Isaiah says in chapter 12 of verse 3. He says, with joy, you will drink deeply from the fountain of salvation. With joy, I'm going to drink deeply. Man, when I wrote that down, I said, God, I want my encounters with you, Jesus, to lead me to dig deep wells. I don't want to worry about so-and-so. I don't want to look to this person. I don't want to stress about what that person is doing. I just want to have a deep encounter with you. Because that Samaritan woman said, you don't have a rope because this is so deep. And Jesus said, I don't need a rope. There is living water that's a begin about to be able to touch you. In fact, I love what it says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 4. It says, the wise words are like deep waters. Wise words are like deep waters. Wisdom flows from the wise like a bubbling brook. I.e., if your friends ain't got no wisdom, bounce them. (laughs) Bounce them. I'm being serious. I spend way too much time with people that your friends are pulling you down. Your friends are gossipers. Your friends are negative. Your friends ain't got no passion, no big, hairy, audacious goal, no vision. All they want to do is tear people down and be negative and be critical. And the scripture right here says, if you want to have a deep encounter with Jesus, you better start hanging around some wise people because wise words are like deep. Waters, wisdom flows from the wise like a bubbling brook, like a Klondike bar. That's what it should say right over there. So here's my question. I want to take just just a few seconds. Write down, how can I dig a deeper well this week? How can I dig a deeper well this week? I mean, be be serious right now. Like, 
just, just think, how can I dig a deeper well? Because deeper is simply going deeper than where you are right now. So you, you might know the Bible back to front, but how can you have an encounter with Jesus digging a deeper well? You, you might be here and saying, hey, pastor, I, I'm just trying to figure out this whole Jesus thing. And, and right now we have a lot of us, a lot of people that are just kind of new Christians and coming from different religious backgrounds. And I mean, I'm meeting more atheists than ever before here in the church because we're giving them freedom and a, and, and a place just to experience the presence of God. So ma- no matter where you're at, how can you dig a deeper well? I mean, is it simply committing to say, I'm going to soap every single day? And when you go out uh, at the Connect Center, there are soap guides, soap uh, little things. You can log on to our website, fusionchurch.cc slash soap, and you can download the PDF. But maybe it's saying, I'm going to dig a deeper well because I'm the soap every day. G- guys, coming up. Father's Day weekend, if you've got kids in the home, I'm going to dig a deeper well by praying with my children, potentially praying with my spouse every single night. I'm going to dig a deeper well. I'm going to buy a book, and it's going to challenge me to go deeper, not surface level. I'm going to dig a deeper well by not being selfish anymore and serving in the church, or I'm going to take a step in faith. I mean, there's so many different practical ways that you can dig a deeper well. Can I give you the biggest challenge for me? How can I dig a deeper well? Be quiet in the presence of God. Be quiet in the presence of God. Just honestly, I struggle so much with that. And so this week, I practiced time in silence in the presence of God. And for me, I love worship music. So I can have it playing all the time, and I'm good. Anyone else like that? Like, as long, I mean, I don't have other music playing. I don't have the news playing. I don't have ESPN playing. I got worship music playing. And I just felt that God said, Brendan, if you want to dig a deeper well to have an encounter with me, turn it off. I was like, <gasps> what am I going to do? I mean, just me and my mind. And he said, that's exactly where I want you. Because I want to dig deeper well. I want to deal with some deeper labels that you have. Every one of us have labels. Don't let your label stop you from having an encounter with Jesus. And sometimes worship, sometimes all these things can stop us. And for me this week, it was just putting it away. A lady joined us on Wednesday morning at from 9 to 10. Every Wednesday, we have prayer and worship here. And, uh, and she came and she joined us for the first time. And so she had just got out of uh, working an overnight shift in Atlantic City. And she came here in her uniform and, uh, and she snuck in there. And I was sitting at the back there during our Wednesday morning, nine to 10 prayer. And I, and I literally watched her begin to have an encounter with Jesus right there, back row. And then all of a sudden I looked, I was like, where did she go? And she was flat on her face, on her knees, in the presence of God. And she got up, all her makeup was off. It was down. And she said, I'm I'm so glad I don't have to go to work. I'm going home because her makeup was trash. Ladies, you know what you're talking about. When you're like, oops, I didn't wear that. What what is that? That waterproof mascara thing that my wife tells me about. I'm like, waterproof mascara? That stuff's even available? And, And she had an encounter. Because why? She said to herself last weekend, I'm gonna dig a deeper well. I'm going to dig a deeper well. People rocked up on Wednesday night at our revival prayer, 6.30. They dug a deeper well. Maybe at the end, we're going to have our whole prayer team and a few extra people because I think there's some labels that need to be thrown off of our lives and you need to have an encounter. And maybe for you, digging the deeper well is getting yourself out of the seat and saying, hey, I'm going to have some faith and some boldness to come and have someone pray for me up front here. Here's this last uh, point today. If we give him permission, point number three, if we give him permission, he takes brokenness and makes it whole. If we give him permission, he takes brokenness and makes it whole. This Samaritan lady was horrendously broken. And yet Jesus made her whole. (laughs) In fact, she goes back to her town and starts a ministry, literally. And again, I think the challenge through this message series on encounters is sometimes us as church people judge those that are far from Jesus. And sometimes Jesus uses those people 
more than he uses us. Every one of us has got a label today. Verse 16 of that scripture, it says, he told her, go and call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied to Jesus. You are right. You say when you have no husband, the fact is that you have had five, had five husbands. And the man that you are now is not your husband. What you have said is quite true. The scripture says that truth sets us free. The greatest path to wholeness is to simply be true. The greatest path to wholeness and encounter with Jesus is to allow truth to set you free. See, when I confess my labels, I'm free. When I go to my wife and I say, honey, I'm struggling with lust, you know what happens? I'm free. When I come to my team and I say, man, I'm just discouraged right now. I need someone to pray for me. I have a label that, of failure that, because I have a fear of failure in my life. It's a very real label. You know what happens? My team starts praying for me and that label is broken because when I speak the label of truth, because she could have said to Jesus, oh, I'm good, I'm good. In fact, I'm getting my pail and I'm out of here. I'm getting my bucket and I'm out of here. I I don't need to have an encounter. In fact, you're Jewish and I'm Samaritan and I'm just going to leave. But she turns around and she says, please, there's a lot of stuff. What you've said is quite true. And I desperately need an encounter with Jesus. See, when we give Jesus permission to speak into our lives, he takes our brokenness and he makes it whole. And and the promise that I want to close with today as we bring this to a close, the promise is this, found in Isaiah chapter 58. So I would love for you to take that scripture because there's so much in John chapter 4. But Isaiah 58, as we close, says this. This is the promise that we take. It says, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You'll be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. See, what what the prophet Isaiah was saying, and this was spoken of my life when I was 19 years old, just trying to figure out life. My first year in ministry in South Africa, literally living in a significantly challenging housing situation, not, not having a concept of the future that God had for me. And then this young lady comes and she says, I believe that the Lord wants to tell you about Isaiah 58. I'd never even read this. And when I began to look at it, it said, the Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Today, how many of us are living in a sun-scorched land? Every single one of us. If you're not living in a sun-scorched land, maybe you need to see a doctor. Because it is rough. It is not easy. When you look at the economy and you look at the future and you see things that are going on, it's sun scorched out there. But then it says, He will satisfy your needs and He will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well watered garden, like a spring whose waters do not fail. Where does the spring come from? Under the earth. Literally saying that, Lord Jesus will be your sustenance. This is a promise that I believe that he's speaking to some of us that have come in today carrying labels on our life, labels of failure, labels of disappointment, labels of confusion, labels of anxiety, labels of I'm not good enough. And he wants to break those labels today. He says this in verse 12. He says, you, you and your people will rebuild the ancient ruins, the devastation that we see in our region. I believe that God is sovereignly beginning to raise people up in our churches so that he would begin to rebuild the ancient ruins. If there's failure and disappointment, if there's fear and anxiety, he wants to rebuild that in your life. And he says, here is the promise, and I will raise up the age-old foundations, the dreams that you used to have that somehow have been hidden, somehow have been covered up, somehow have been placed 
on the sideline because of the busyness of your life. I believe that he tells you today, I want to resurrect those dreams. I want to bring them back to the forefront with my blessing upon them to do something that you've never understood, you've never conceived, you've never comprehended, but because you've had an encounter with me, because you've placed off of those labels and you've admitted in truth that you desperately need an encounter, this promise will come to pass. In fact, the scripture in Isaiah 58 verse 12 says that you will be called the repairer of the broken walls. Broken walls in young men's lives broken walls in young children's lives, broken walls in marriages, broken walls in health, and broken walls in finances, that I believe God is raising up a nation of people, a generation of changes that will be the repairer of the broken wall. In fact, in the King James, it says the repairer of the breach. The walls of Jerusalem were breached. Your marriage has been breached. Your finances have been breached. Your health has been breached. Your mind has been breached. Your purity has been breached. There's been a breaching. And Jesus sovereignly says today, I am the great physician. I am the one that steps in and binds up the brokenhearted. I am the one that takes the blind and gives them sight. I am the one, Jesus, that takes those that are behind the prison bars, those of us that have come in with labels and says, now I give you a future and a hope. Let's pray. Jesus, we submit ourselves to you right now. We desperately need you. We cry out for you. We ask that you would sovereignly speak in this moment. Sovereignly allow us to have an encounter with you right now in Jesus Christ's name.